All right, I'd like to welcome everybody out here to uh, Project Action on Podcast One. Got, uh, I guess, uh, fellow podcaster Brian Deegan here, good friend of mine, along with Josh Martelli, going to be tag team in the interview with me. But, uh, Brian, I guess, first of all, reason for this, you know how I am, I just steamroll everything, went to a, from a phone interview to here we are with a film crew and uh, talking in your shop here. But you got a new podcast coming out on Podcast One, I know, uh, yeah. this week, man. Give us, uh, before we jump into the cool interview part, give us yeah. a lowdown on what you guys got going. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, one of those things that, I've heard a lot about the podcast, you know, movement, right? So a lot of uh, excitement about guys that are doing podcasts. And, and I really, to be honest, stayed away from it because I didn't understand it really. I didn't know how it worked for me. And I've been so busy with the kids and, and sponsorships and marketing and, and, you know, just family. It's just so busy. I'm like, how could I fit in one more thing? And, and so, but after, you know, working out and talking to the guys from Podcast One, they really laid it out for me like, hey, we have a team of people that are going to help you through this and, and uh, real professional. And, and, I said, and I looked at it. I'm like, okay, this is a cool way to tell stories, a cool way to go back into the history of all the things I've done in my life and then involve my daughter and my sons and you know, my wife and all their subjects and what they have to talk about. And I think we're going to cover a lot of bases. And and maybe, you know, the goal is to really help people, right? So if someone's struggling in moto to make it or someone's struggling in off-road or struggling in parenting or family or, or, or parenting, maybe something I've done or in my life or something I'll say will help them. That's cool to me. So I think that's kind of the moral behind the podcast. And I'm excited, you know. I, I think it's going to be cool, you know. I don't know. I don't mind how much work I'm getting myself <laughs> into right now, but um, I'm excited. Yeah, well, I know you, between you and your daughter and the whole family, you guys got your hands in uh, about a million different things. But I know, like, the first episode, this is one, and I, obviously we want people to go over and tune in and, and check it out. But uh, I know you and Travis Pastrana sat down. And uh, that's one of those, I think, me as a fan of action sports and motocross, like, and anybody, like, this is probably, like, you two sitting at a table or, or over the phone, like, a one-hour conversation, like, to me, the dude, that, that's mind-blowing, because I know, like, for the longest time, people thought you guys hated each other and this and that, and I, like, I see so many parallels between you guys and family men now and things like that, and, like, I mean, we want people to go and listen to it, but that had to have been a fun conversation for you two guys to have. Oh, for sure. You know, I, I thought about, okay... This is my opportunity to talk to people in my industry, and I couldn't think of a better person, like realistically, that has been involved in my life at certain points in the competition, in, in the d- darkest, deepest, you know, moments to the highest of highs. He's been around me and competing against me, you know, like so. We, you know, I had moments where I hated the dude, like literally, <laughs> like I'm like I hated it that he beat me all the time and. And um, he was the good guy. We were the bad guys with the militia. And it just kind of played out perfectly and with X Games and TV. And uh, in the beginning, yeah, we really did have an issue, I think, you know. But he was a young kid. I think we were just being being haters, you know. But <laughs> now that I look back at it. But it was, hey, it, it was real. And um, then it kind of panned out over the years, right. And, Travis, you, you had to respect the guy because he's just that gnarly. So, uh, you know, it was cool to be able to have him on the first episode of the Deegan's uh, podcast. I just thought that was a perfect way to start it. You know, and episode zero will be on that also, which kind of describes who we are. If you don't really know about my family and haven't followed us on social, I think it'll be a good intro to who we are, you know. Yeah, well, I'm talking about your family, dude. I, I mean, we rolled up here. It's the first time I've been at your compound. I know I think Josh has been here. You guys did, uh, what was it, like yard work, yard work, yard work, yard work yeah, together yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. But, dude, like I roll up, I mean, is it, you know, we're in this amazing shop here. I mean, we've got, you know, this X Games, you know, the West Coast Choppers bike. Like, to me, that's like the bike that I always like. Yeah. I can't believe I'm looking at it, man, because, like, this is the yeah, bike. Yeah. Like, I was like, if I could pick one bike I wanted, like, in yeah. my collection, that would be it. But, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, as part of you look back on this, uh, you know, kid that grew up in the Midwest and go, man, like, who, who who would ever thought? You know, it's crazy. You know, it, it, that's the thing about, you know, I did a documentary, you know, not, not less than a year ago with Paul Tobley. And that documentary explained, you know, where I came from in a small town in Nebraska, chased my dreams to California, really didn't have money, came out here to chase this pro motocross career. I didn't make it in motocross and went into freestyle motocross and took a lot of chances and helped build action sports with X Games. And um, so many good stories, you know, and I was able to meet guys like Jesse James who helped build all my dirt bikes, which is pretty cool. And I kept them all because I knew one day those two strokes would be badass. And so we're starting to break them out now. Uh, But 
the story goes, you know, coming from a small town and, and not taking no for an answer and, and going against the grain and taking chances and not wanting to go back. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's still happening to this day. I still have that drive of like small town kid trying to go against the odds. And, and I can't believe all the people I've met. I've met a lot of my heroes, you know, like a lot of my heroes. When I was a little kid, I had pictures of Ricky Johnson on my wall, Jeff Ward. Uh, you know, now those dudes, I call them, you know, all the time. We talk like friends all the time. Ne- never what I thought when I was a little kid, those would, my heroes would be my friends, right? So, but that just in reality shows that it can happen, right? Like that can happen. Yeah. So. Well, and you talk about a small town and I know like I'm from a small town, Matt, you guys are small town, you and your brother, or Matt and Josh. Um, but it's like, you know, I feel like some of us, you know, with that upbringing, you know, and like you said, that blue collar work ethic, like I know me, like even to this day, I do pretty well for myself. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I think all of us sitting here yeah. do well for ourselves, but like, I'm always scared. Like to me, like at some point the rug's going to be pulled out from under me. Yeah. So it's like, you still to this day, it's like you have that drive to do, to do yeah. more and go farther, you know? Yeah. I always, and it, trust me, I think about that because it's in my contracts, right? If I screw up too bad, I start losing deals. But um, it's pretty funny, like, because I'll, I'll let it out of the bag. But, like, they're in contracts, if you ever had an athlete contract, it usually says in there, if you get um, arrested for something like a, a felony, right, they can take your contract, yeah. right? But I put in there, I said, no, I have to be convicted of a felony. <laughs> like, so, anyway, that kind of describes my militia, my militia days. And, um, but, but obviously things have changed with family, but it's cool because in my, my, uh, era, I was able to be a racer, supercross. I was dead serious about uh, racing, went to freestyle. We were partying and being crazy, setting this image of the militia and X games. And, um, and then went back to racing and and then family, but it's kind of cool because even I still, to this day, obviously I screw up and have my bad days, but I'm still always can just blame it on the militia, right? I can be like, Hey, that's militia. (laughs) You got like a built in scapegoat for life. So it's all good. Dude. One thing I've noticed about you, yeah. Brian, is you've you've kind of turned into a pretty awesome, inspirational dude, man. Like a lot of your posts are, it's not just raw aggression anymore. I think it's like a, a settled in, like fatherly kind of advice that's coming <laughs> yeah, out yeah, of you. Yeah. It's really cool to see as somebody who has a kid too. Yeah. It's it's cool to point to that and go, yeah, this look at what this dude's doing with his family. You know? Yeah, no, thanks. It's cool because you know, growing up. You know, like I said, I, I, my dad raised me. I was focused on racing, and that's all that really mattered to me. And then, I, you know, I, as I grew up and then went through X Games, and it was really about me and my buddies, and we were being rebel guys. And, and we didn't really care what influence we had on people. Like, we really were, were doing, you know, gnarly things. And, you know, and, and I didn't really think about the kids, to be honest, because like, right. I didn't have kids, right. you know. And so once I had kids, I started going, man, everything I do or say – is influencing the youth. And, and then I watch my kids get influenced by other people, such as musicians or different things that I'm like, man, I don't really want that, like right. certain things that are bad. And then I started saying, you know what? That's probably not good for me to do things that can influence kids in a bad way. Right. And, you know, even though it does happen, you know, I'm, I'm human. But the, overall, I said, if I have this, this platform and I can help people get better on their bad days and that's cool right because right. i've been in that position you know of, of people having the bad days or, or struggling to make success happen and i just felt like if i could help people with that that's cool so anyway that's kind of a thing that's just naturally progressed i guess yeah no it is really cool and and, and travis has done the same thing yeah. you know a lot of guys in the sport i think that have that have matured they've you know got married yeah. had kids started families now they're they're putting that energy back out there in a positive way. It's cool to see. Yeah, you know? which could I mean you could it could go many different ways, right? Like, yeah. um, but Travis, you know, Travis had his moments, right? He was good, goody, a good guy. Then he kind of went to party guy when we went to good guy, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, it's just cool, whatever. He's late bloomer. I think the, the party guy's still there. The party guy's yeah. still there too. I just yeah. don't know if it's quite as public. But. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There were, so. there were a couple weird rally races we won't talk yeah, about. Yeah, I'm there sure. In I'm sure a lot's brushed under the rug. <laughs> but but it is cool because he, he's a father now. He has kids, which a lot of us are now, yeah. right? So we a lot have, a lot of us are fathers, you know, married or have kids and there's more to life than just us now. So it's it's a different way, you know, way yeah. of looking at it. Yeah. Well, you know, and talking about that, I think one of the cool things, you know, is 
I know Josh has got a question on social media, and I know, you know, but, like, when you started your career, social media wasn't out there, you know, and, and so, you know, you had, you know, the – the events that were televised on TV and X Games every year and stuff like that, where people really got to know you. You know, we're talking magazines before we went on to air and things like that, but it was really hard to get your story out. So you had these these brief glimpses into Brian Deegan that people were judging you on, you know, and, yeah. and then in between they saw nothing, yeah. you know, other than maybe a video you put out and things like that. Now, like, you know, instantly you can pull your phone out of your pocket and it's like, bam, you have instant access to millions yeah. of people, you know. And so, like, I think it's interesting how this entire movement and, and just how you probably approach sponsorship and, and generating income, you know, when you first started out versus now, like the business model, everything's completely changed, different. man. Yeah, it's different, you know. And, like, our big moments were X Games, you know, when, when – we had a moment it, on TV that was X Games, and that was once a year, twice a year. That so when that happened, we were like, "Oh, it's we're going all out. We're going to steal the camera time, and we have to get the most out of this hour or whatever it was, good or bad. We got the media, you know." And so now you have every day. I wake up and do media. I wake up and check media. I go to bed and check media. Like at the end of the day, it's it's all day. If I like want to hire someone, I just go on their Facebook. I just go on their, you know, I go on Instagram. How who is this guy, right? So it's too easy to research people now, but. It's easy to, to follow athletes and pick your guy. And I feel like, you know, now I've had a good run of five, ten years of, you know, being a dad and, and focused on family. Is that I think no matter what, even if someone's, you know, like my image I had, it took a while to shake that image, you know, from the militia days. And, and you know, people are like, oh, Deegan was, you know, he's, he's a bad dude or he does this or he does that. And people are like, no, I really, you don't know him. You know, I've heard that a lot. But now it's like socials told the story, right? It's, it's more of live by your actions is what we've done over, you know, the last so many years. So, yeah, I think even if I did have a mishap or screw up, people kind of go, well, we kind of know who this dude is now. Like, because of social media, right? It, it's hard to hide anything anymore. You know, I heard that, like, with social, there's going to come a day where you can't hide anything yeah. anymore. Probably part of you loves that yeah. social wasn't around at a pertinent oh, certain part yeah, of the day, right? Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and me and my buddies say that one, too. We're like, thank God there was no cell phones back in our day. Yeah, uh, uh, but, yeah, it's because uh, everything's documented now. Everything, you know, which, hey, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but it's a much tougher generation for kids to grow up in now. It is. It just is, you know, because you're under the microscope. Under the microscope, you know. So, yeah. yeah. So you've got this amazing run going on right now with Haley's career and this, this mm-hmm. trajectory within NASCAR. And I just wanted to touch on that for a second, especially as it pertains to social media, because what I noticed, you guys talked about it a, a, maybe a few weeks ago on Instagram, is you guys are putting up some serious numbers. Like, mm-hmm. you guys have a, an incredible following. Yeah. Um, and that speaks both to how authentic you guys are on camera, how often you post. I mean, you are your own production factory right now. It's pretty awesome to watch. What's it like to be essentially teaching like a 71 year old company <laughs> how to do this? I mean, yeah. they're, you know, they do a pretty good job of it with the people that they have to yeah. not knocking them. But I mean, you guys have definitely hit on a formula that I think a lot of people could learn from. So yeah, is that happen organically over time or is it something you guys put a lot of, a lot of effort into or? Yeah, I think if we, you know, had to break down the social media, um, got at like the, uh, storyline for where we started the timeline, man, it's, it'd be a long story, but long story short, we've been in it since the beginning or tried to be, you know, and, and, the, and I was, the first of it, right? I was the athlete. I was at X Games. I was at all these events. We started posting, posting. And then I saw it as like when Haley came up, really Hayden came up before uh, Haley. Hayden was the crazy moto kid at six years old ripping on a dirt bike that myself and, you know, say Twitch and Feist and all these guys were posting about Hayden years ago. And so his social blew up first. But I always shared that. I always shared my platform with the kids to help build them. And then there came a time when, Haley, I said, Hayden, there's going to come a time when Haley's going to nuke all of us. But the main thing was having this Deegan family um, structure where we all help each other. Because right. Haley is going to reach a demographic that's much different than what Hayden's going to reach, right? right? Haley's reaching this car market with NASCAR. And out of all the motorsports in America, NASCAR's still the biggest, right? They still have the hugest, like the, the biggest reach, even though Supercross in our eyes is everything and we think it's the world, right? So, so, but it's a small little niche thing compared to NASCAR. So when Haley's finding her way through the ranks of NASCAR, which she's still low, right? She's K&N, ARCA. She still has to go to Trucks, Xfinity, and then Cup is the big one. But they're trying to tell a story like, hey, wait, Danica left. We have this girl coming, this girl that can win. And, and so 
the media is jumping on it. So we're getting flooded with media, and, and you can see Haley's already ranked in the top three of all NASCAR drivers in social media. And that, that has a lot to do with her popularity, but it has a lot to do with what we've built. We've already yeah. built this this engine of, you know, Instagram, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all this together as a family. And, and her numbers are strong because of what we built. We didn't just start building that this year or last year with Haley. You know, she had already had good numbers when she went to NASCAR. And, and uh, NASCAR is looking at us going, okay, we, we own Twitter. That's our zone. That's East Coast. So how do we get more involved in the West Coast game of social media? And we've been working with them. They've been working with us. They have obviously a ton to offer us in, in TV and in um, media uh, time. But if we can help bring some youth to the sport and connect them to a demographic that they have struggled to get to, it's going to be a win-win, you know? Yeah. So Well, it seems like that's what you guys are doing. You're, you're, you're touching on a level of entertainment or accessibility that maybe people it's really resonating with a certain group of their fans, you know, and it may yeah. not even be the people that show up to the physical races. It's, it's maybe more the casual user that's just turning it on and watching the races. But I think that's a really important takeaway for them. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And they watch, right. They, they're, they have a whole team and we go meet with them, you know, probably once a month we're in their office. And, and um, so they have a team of so, of social and marketing. They look at the numbers and they, they look at the posts. And, and a lot of posts say, hey, I used to watch NASCAR 10 years ago and I quit watching it, but now I watch it again because of you. Because of you, the way you've connected us through social. And, and, um, and it's not just her. There's a group of young kids that do it pretty good uh, in NASCAR that are coming up. And I think, it, I think you know, you like to, like to think there, there'll be a rise again in the sport, but I think there needs to be some more young drivers with strong social get up into the bigger ranks to really make it move. Right. Oh. And what, yeah. what do you, what do you take about this too? And, and social aside, but you're talking about those young kids, like we've got your daughter Haley. Um, then I look and we've got Sheldon Creed. We got Zane Smith, Riley Herbst. We've got all these off-road kids like, and dude, they're shredding. Yeah. yeah. You know what, what, what is your take? Cause you're a dirt guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you know, they're like invading this stock car world and it's like kids here from the West yeah. coast that grew up in the dirt, man. Like, yeah. I mean, you've been to enough races. I mean, what do you take? What do you, what do you think? Cause I've never been behind the wheel of a stock car. Yeah. You know, like what, what do you think? What's the reason behind that? Cause these four kids are just shredding. Yeah. Ryan. They're doing good. And, and they didn't grow up in it. So that's the other thing, you know, yeah. a lot of these parents groom their kids from the quarter midgets to, uh, you know, the, uh, the bandoleros to up through the legend cars. And then they get into a late model. And that's kind of the, the ranks that you go through. And a lot of these off-road kids, they didn't do that, no. you know? So, but, They're in mod carts or, you know, UTVs or dirt yeah. bikes and just whatever, you know? Yeah. So I think that there's no secret that, like, say, Jeff Gordon and you have Tony Stewart, guys that came from the dirt. There's no secret that dirt is the secret uh, uh, ingredient to be good driving a loose race car. But, you know, I raced uh, super late models for a couple of years back when Pastrana was going to NASCAR. NASCAR called and they wanted me to try to make a run at it. And I'd raced rallycross and a few things, so I thought I could do it. And I went to the local track and no one really knows, but I raced for a couple of years in stock cars. Didn't make it because I didn't have the funding to write that crazy seven-figure check at the time. But, um... The bottom line is it's it's harder than people think. You know, you think, oh, I'm just going in a circle. It's so much based upon how good you are at tire wear, um, how good you are at car setup. And, and uh, if you're off a tenth, you know, by the end of the race, you're going to be lapped at least a couple times. So um, it's so important about the equipment, like I said. But the car at the end of the race, no matter what, you're going to start getting loose and the cars start sliding. That's where these off-road kids are, are shining. You know, that's where the Sheldon Creed, Sheldon Creed had to tone it down because he was so aggressive. He was, you know, getting too aggressive in the stock cars. But once he figured it out, he started running up front. And then you have Zane, you know, you have Herps. All came from the Mod Cart program, which I still think is the best program for kids to learn is the Mod. Uh, the whole karting program. I think the best thing Lucas Oil has going is their karting program. You know, if I wanted to say I want Hayden to learn how to race, I'd put him through the karting program, and I feel like he'd be ready to go pretty much anywhere. And, and so, um, anyway, all those kids came from that program, and they all can drive loose race cars, you know? And that's what's the key. Like, they are going to be good when the, the, the karting guys and, and the pavement guys at the end of the race are all scared because their car is sliding at 150, 200 miles per hour, and these dudes are in their comfort zone. Big difference, you know? And that's where Haley is. She's in her comfort zone when that car is sliding. You know, people, when she did her test drives in front of Toyota and all the, all the higher-ups, they are like, We've never seen a girl get in a car like that and drive that many consistent laps sideways. 
and, and be perfect every lap. And I'm like, dude, that's off road. That's like every lap, every turn, you know. So. General Tire delivers. Well, I, I know the first time I actually really got to see Haley drive, like I, you know, I'd seen her race mod carts or whatever. But uh, a couple years ago, we were all back there at Minnesota for uh, Terracross, oh, yeah. and you and Haley came out to uh, to race, and uh, you know, and there, there's all of us there, and uh, like you go and you burned a quick lap, and everybody's Haley's got their qualifying yeah. runs in. Yeah. Here comes Haley, and like nobody expected anything, <laughs> right? We thought, you know, she's going to be good. She goes out there, and you got guys like Luberg, who I, you know, that guy is just phenomenal behind yeah. the wheel, and like. These champs and, like, you know, I think maybe Ronnie Anderson was there. Here comes Haley, never been in a razor before. Dude, like, blew everybody out of the water. <laughs> Guys, girls, Sarah Price just destroyed everybody. And everybody's like, what the yeah, hell yeah, just yeah. happened? And I'm like, <laughs> Here's a girl. I'm like, this is scary that she's that fast in something she'd never actually even driven before. She goes yeah, out, bes- you know, just destroyed everybody. And everybody's, like, jaws were on the floor. It was like, yeah. what just well, happened? I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 qualifying, be, right? There, yeah, yeah, there yeah. is a guy out in the yard from France <laughs> building a track in Ryan's yeah, front yard. Some secrets, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we we have honest. a few UTVs around here, yeah. But no, she was just getting introduced to UTVs at the time, and yeah. And for her to go up there and be the fastest qualifier and and have no fear, and you know, no fear, I think comes with a lot of your upbringing. It has a lot to do with not having a lot of crashes or injuries yet either. Yeah. So um, and then she had a good, she flipped backwards. Yeah, there she did a backflip. <laughs> they got this thing is dug out. Yeah. Somebody, I can't remember. Somebody paused at the top. She did a complete backflip yeah. in the UTV, lands on the wheels, gassed it, went. And and it's, see, it's stuff like that. It's the moments like Those that, though, moments, where yeah. it's not planned. It's not anything you can film, you can plan for, but it's how you react. And, like, the way Haley reacted right there, like, you know, there's a couple thousand people watching. Like, yeah. boom, instant fans. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, it, yeah. and it wasn't like she, that's authentic. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. just her personality to do that. Yeah. A lot of people would have got out, got mad, started yelling at the guy in front of her, like, Haley, no, we're just going to mash the gas and go. Insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was a fun event for sure. No, we had a good time there. So sure. I want to go back to the beginning, though, and I, we don't have to, like, go the entire career arc because we don't have enough time. But, like, I mean, what, give us some moments in your career because I know, like, one that stands out for me. I know, like, you moved at a young age, you know what I mean, from Midwest and, you know, wanted to make it as a Supercross rider. I know, like, and one of the moments that stands out in my mind is, like, you know, there's the big iconic where you ghost rode the motorcycle and things like that. Yeah. But, I mean, what, what are some of the moments you think that really kind of – kind of put you on the map and help define where you're at because you were phenomenal at riding supercross but it was just like you know the the transition just kind of naturally happened to fmx right yeah i think it's you know coming from the uh, nebraska the dirt bike was my way out and then i got to meet people from all around the country at the amateur nationals i knew i had to get out of there and i went to uh california and i just turned pro at supercross and um i got on a team but i was always somewhere around that fifth place guy and back then, there was about four, four factory riders, right? One at Yamaha, one at Cowie, one at Honda. There wasn't the top 20 have a ride. Like, right now, there's, there's five guys on each support team, and the top 20 are on factory bikes. We didn't have that. Like, we were out of the back of our van, you know, fifth place, you know? So... The, the, the bottom line is, though, we, I trained super hard. I always had a crazy work ethic. Every day I'd run miles and, and train and do motos and motos. And, and um, so when I came to that Supercross, say, that night when, when I won, I, came, I remember I came off the starting line, and I, and I kind of got lucky on the start. Guys got pushed out, and I, I just was running third. Or, and then I just started catching the leaders because they got tired. And I was getting so nervous because, like, Kevin Windham was coming, and I remember Carmichael, um, um, Ramsey, and Volman were all coming. And I'm, like, leading this race, and I passed Renard for the lead. I could hear the crowd going, wah, screaming. And I was like, I just remember butterflies. I'm like, dude, why am I getting so nervous right now riding? <laughs> and, and I just remember hitting the jumps. I made a mistake, and I was like, oh, don't throw it away. And I was just going to be happy to get on the podium, dude. Like, honestly, because like, I hadn't got on the podium to that point. And so I'm, I'm leading the race, and it's coming down to the last lap, and I just see Wyndham coming. I'm like, dude, Ugh. do not let him beat you. And, and then I was like, he was coming, coming, and I just see him right behind me, and he washes out and crashes. 
And I'm like, dude, two more turns. So I go through and, I, and I just, I'm just like, what do I do? What do I do? And because I like, I didn't know what to do over the finish line because I wasn't planning on winning the race. So I go through the whoops and they're all rutted. I'm like, dude, do not crash. And I go to the finish line. I'm like so excited. I just let go of the bike. And I remember <laughs> flying in the air. And I'm like, dude, this is going to hurt. I was way high. And I fall in, in between the double. And like, boom. And I get up. And I'm like so pumped. And my bike lands perfect and rolls off to the side. And um, they're battling over my head. Second, third, fourth. We're all racing. And I'm like, dude, I didn't, even think, I didn't even care. And I'm like, yeah. Like, yeah, I don't see that crap anymore. You never yeah. see anything like that. Like, it would be. You know, it'd be a hell to pay. And so anyway, that moment was so iconic. And, and, I, and I knew kind of at that point, and I went up on the podium, and I was just so hyped. I was like, I just kicked everyone's ass. And, da-da-da. and the crowd was like, and it, still to this day, like when I go places like gr- the grocery store or wherever around town, people are like, I was there that night. That night you won and go straight your bike. That's the one thing I hear the most out of everything I've done. Yeah, so none you know, of the X Games stuff, nothing. It's like I that hear moment. a little bit that, hey, I was there that night you did the 360 at the Coliseum. Like, that was another big one, but like, there was a lot of people there that night at the LA Coliseum. Like, a lot of moto heads. Like, so it was such an iconic moment. And then after that, there was a factory ride open. I was on a Suzuki, I'd bought at the shop, and, and, um, at that, and then Suzuki had a ride, a spot open because Ferry got hurt. And they gave it to another rider. And that was the moment in my life that I just crushed me. Because I'd, like, worked since I was a little kid to get a factory ride. That's all I wanted. Like, and, and they gave the ride to a slower rider at the time. And I knew at that moment, I was like, it's not going to happen. Like, I'm not going to get a factory ride. And, and, and I, that's when I kind of just got mad, even madder. And, and I was like, fuck this sport. And I was just so mad. And, and then I just went into tricks and freestyle and like what can I do besides racing to make a living and that's when we started doing all the tricks on dirt bikes and Krusty Demons came out Moto Triple X and then and then it kind of snowballed obviously and X Games came around in 99 you guys yeah. I mean you guys yeah. basically started Dogtown of Moto oh, at yeah. that point yeah if you I think mean, about Dogtown is you know uh, the Z Boys whatever that yeah. that that era of like, say the Bones Brigade, right? right. The yeah. Bones Brigade was badass, and yeah. still to this day, they're like, dude, that's cred, like street creds, you know. And, and, and you think of that rejecting, a, yeah, yeah, like the tournament crap. We're not, we don't give a shit about that anymore, right? Yeah, it's about filming and getting cool film parts and just having fun, you yeah. know, you know, out, having fun doing your sport or whatever it was, right. you know. And uh, so I feel like. And I tell that to the guys. I'm like, you know, no matter what, we were the OGs of a movement. We, we had this movement, and they'll never be able to take that away. Right. Like, we were the guys who took a chance. I walked away from racing. I could have kept racing. Who knows? Maybe I would have got a ride one day. Maybe I wouldn't have. And so at the end of the day, I, I, I took a chance. I walked away and uh, started a sport with some other guys, and, and it paid off. You know, it was the right time, and it was a massive risk, and, and, uh, and it worked, you know? So... It's uh, it's. De- I mean, I could definitely go into that more, but at the end of the day, that was a pretty cool moment. Ninety nine X Games. That was one of the coolest things, you know, showing up moto moto guys that were like living out the back of my van to like, you know, there's Tony Hawk, there, you know, there's you know Nyquist, there's you know all these dudes I watched on TV since the ninety nine ninety five X Games when it started. And there's crowds, huge crowds, and then we crack crack up the dirt bikes, and then we start hitting. You know, Mickey Diamond designed this gnarly course on the pier, and we start hitting these eighty foot, hundred foot uh, dirt jumps, wall wall with the dirt bikes, and the crowd just comes running. You know, they've never seen nothing like it, and like thousands of people surround this jump park, and and at that point, I'm like, it's on, like it's freaking on. Like from that point, it was like boom, and and then it just snowballed from there, you know? Well, and it's funny, too, because like you said, at that point, you know, social media wasn't around, anything like that. I mean, there was, you know, internet kind of in its infancy type of thing, but like unless you went to frequented dirt bike shops and went and bought the Krusty's tapes or Terra Firma or any of those, like... You hadn't seen that, you know, and I think, like, that was, like, for people's first experience, yeah. you know, that was, like, their first hit, and it was, like, I remember it was, like, after that, like, it was a talk on, you know, anywhere, like, yeah. schoolyard, you know, grocery store, coffee shop, everybody's like, dude, did you watch what happened at X Games? Like, you guys yeah, overnight yeah, yeah. went from, like, nobodies <laughs> to, like, superstars, Superstar man. status, yeah, and, and it's funny, because racing hated it. Mm. Supercross guys hated it. Like, I talked to Mitch Payton, you know, about it and this, that, and then he's like, those dudes hated freestyle. They thought we were like, they were, I, I think they were just haters, like, in the end, because they were like, these dudes couldn't make it in racing, so they went and went and did a freestyle motocross, and now they're all partying and screwing around. 
but making money, having fun, and like killing it, like basically to where where they're like, we want to play. Like after a while, you know, yeah. Supercross had to be a part of X Games. That's when I started laughing because I'm like, you don't understand. We were like anti Supercross, right? We were anti all racing, and then eventually it came to X Games. I think it came to X Games after that first hit, right? And X Games was so so much hype and so so um. So punk rock when it first started, it was just punk rock. Like that was X Games, and and I just feel like that that you know late nineties, early two thousands of, of the action sport movement was so 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 much energy in it, and I feel like it, I don't know if it'll ever get repeated. That you know, I think a new movement will have to start to ever get that much hype again. You know, that much energy that it had. Well, and, like, the whole thing with, like, the militia, you know, mm-hmm. because I remember, you know, apparel sh- sales, like, overnight, it was like, yeah. that, I don't think dirt bike shops, anybody could keep that stuff in stock, but, you know, that whole thing, like, that wasn't, you know, I mean, now we know you're this master marketer and things like that, but at that point, it was pretty authentic, like, yeah. it was just you guys being you, right? There was, like, no master plan, we're going to yeah. have this click, and we're going to take over, and that was just you guys being you, right? It was. Like, the end of the day, we had this group of guys, and, you know, um, you know, say one of the guys had had the land, so his family had tractors in the land, so we all went there for the jump park, and then we kind of had this little clicky group that was like Twitch, Feist, uh, you know, Feist moved out from the East Coast, he was a racer, I talked him out of, like, racing to come hang with us, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, he's a roommate, he, I needed him to help me pay rent, and, and then, uh, and then we had, you know, had Larry, and then we had, uh, there's a small group when it first started, and and uh, we were rough, like it was uh, was uh, uh, was real and authentic. And, and we started spray painting militia on hats with stencils and T-shirts. And that's when people were like, "We want it," but there was no social media to go. Okay, like we want your stuff. Where do you get it? Like it was kind of like, okay, I can tell there's crowds of people like spray painting metal militia on their on their clothes and, and signs. How do we? get this public uh to, to to rep our product and that that's when we said man let's i guess we should start a clothing company and that was 99 you know 20 years ago and and you know that was where we opened up a little shop not a shop but a, a warehouse and started printing t-shirts super simple basic icon t-shirts and, and started selling them to and then the shops were buying everyone started buying them buying them buying them. and about two three years in i'm like dude wh- what do we do this thing's at like millions of dollars and I don't know how to run it. Like it's going too fast. And, and that's when we went to, uh, Cameron Steele helped us like go down and meet some people. And we ended up meeting the guys at La Jolla who were a big distribution company for clothing who did O'Neill surf and a bunch of big brands. And they said, okay, your brand's got a lot of hype and, and we're willing to take it on and distribute it across the world. Um, and this is the deal. We ended up signing a deal with them and, and, and dude, it blew up. Like I was like, this is crazy how big it grew. And which was cool about that movement, we started making money and we were able to build jump parks. We were able to, to pay riders. You know, we we're putting food on the table for, for all our athletes. And I mean, it was a good run, you know, like to think like to able to turn something into, into a business and feed your riders. Like that was pretty cool. You know, that was probably the coolest part of it. And 20 years ago, like that's, dude, that's like makes me feel old, man. 20, <laughs> 20 years ago, like this year. And, and what's cool about it. We, we, um, we went through ups and downs, obviously all the whole industry did. Uh, you know, we lost a lot of action sport brands. I'm not going to name them all, but we know a lot of them went away, right? So, and Militia still stood the test of time. La Jolla eventually it ran its course with its contract. We went to a different clothing license, and the guy really, really fumbled the ball, um, which we took it back from him just recently and gave it to a new company to run it. Because at the end of the day, I don't have time to go print T-shirts and, and box them, right? So we hired the guys to do that. The new guys are doing a great job. So you're going to see a new resurgence of militia this year. Like you are. It's, it sounds nice. funny, <laughs> but it's coming back. And, and yeah, will it ever be the militia of the 90s? Probably not. We're, we're like, I'm, you know, in my 40s and have kids. Like, but hey, yeah. hey, Tony Hawk's still a badass, right? Yeah. You know, well, like it's funny, said, though, yeah, there's yeah, like yeah. this era of icons. And yeah. Josh and I were talking about that earlier today. Like you and, you know, mentioned Pastrana, obviously Feist and Twitch are in there. But I mean, you talk about Nyquist and Mira. Yeah. And like there, there was like this whole, and, it's not taking anything away from, like, the Nigel Houstons mm-hmm. of the world now yeah. and these other guys, but, like, there was just this – it was, like, the golden era of action sports, and I don't mean that, like, the guys aren't talented now because we can talk about oh, what yeah. they're doing on a dirt bike and guys like Jacko and yeah. things like that, but, like, I don't know. That was just so, – there was magic in those – that you, you know, those years yeah. right there. That decade. It was a decade of just, like, like good characters, you know, guys that were, were authentic and, 
and I'm just all different. And, and it was cool because we all – we didn't get along, right? So when we <laughs> first came to X Games, they were mad. They hated us. They were like, they were like, F these moto dudes. Like, they're taking all the spotlight. And I remember we went to Gravity Games, NBC, and we, this is the first, 99, we went into the industry party, the NBC, like, party for the people that work at NBC. A very nice ballroom. We come up the escalator, right? And there's all the BMXers and all the dudes. We come, it wasn't even minutes and we were fighting. Dude. And it was like <laughs> ripping each other's shirts off and throwing. I just remember throwing dudes, like, we're going down the escalator, falling down. And I just remember that's when I kind of met, um, I guess that's when we, you know, say Nyquist and Mira. And that's when I first ran into Mira because he ran by and punched me and, and i was like whoa we started fighting and then feist came flying through the air with a karate kick and like missed and fell on the ground and it was so funny we laughed about it after uh but at the end of the day i'm like that was like it was a fight for the was, territory you know it was, know? Punk, rock, it was punk rock and you don't see that now like you know that stuff don't go down now yeah. but oh well at the end of the day i mean it made for, it makes for good stories but yeah. it was a cool era well and I, that leads you and i gotta ask this question because i know mira i mean he was a dear friend of mine i know you guys were good friends and things like that but you guys had a boxing match was oh, that yeah. like carryover from that like uh, you know and i know I at the end of the you it, know yeah. i know it was like at the end of the the fight dude it was like mutual respect and everything else but yeah, yeah. did you carry some of that into the boxing oh match? yeah because he got me good that day like <laughs> i was i was coming down the escalator and i was like chasing some dude and he punched me like from the side i was like dude it was a good hit and, and then uh but yeah i was like kind of that i didn't like forget about that but but um but anyway it was cool because when when um What's his name? Ellis asked us. <laughs> yeah, he asked. He asked, hey, would you be interested in fighting at, at my show? And I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. And kind of like, because you know the, what he has going on there. And he's like, hey, if I could get another good uh, x Games guy for you to box, would you do it? I said, yeah, why not? You know, I like training. I love boxing and MMA stuff. So he, he uh, says, okay, calls. He's like, I, got, I go, it's got to be someone within 10 pounds of me. Like, I don't want some monster. And so... He said, okay, I got Mira. And I said, all right. I thought, I thought about it. And I was like, dude, okay. But what I thought about was cool because I'm like, Mira is a gold medalist, right? He, he is, he's a, he's a, he, you know, definitely has been beat up and come back. And, and I go, we have the same mindset. We both do not want to lose, like, no matter at all costs. So anyway, I said, it'll be a good competition. I went into training. He went into training. He went to L.A. and just started training for, like, months or whatever, right, with a boxing coach. And I went to Northern California to Stockton and trained with Mike Tyson's coach. <laughs> and and, and uh, it was cool, though. And, he, and, and once I was ready, we started going to all the hole-in-the-wall boxing gyms in Stockton. This is like Stockton's gnarly. And, and um, we just show up, go in, who's the right, who's about my size, get in the ring, do rounds. Boom, boom, boom. And then that's when we went to Nick and Nate Diaz yeah. um, gym. And he had some fighters. We got in the ring and do. We went rounds. And, and it was probably one of the gnarliest few months of my life of like testing myself and seeing, okay, do you got what it takes? And when we showed up to fight that night, dude, we were both ripped. We were both dude, like, you guys were cut. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I remember I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I think everybody, you guys walked in, everybody thought it was going to be another Ellis kind of joke. Yeah, yeah. Joke. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. joke you guys fight. walked in, and I think it was immediately like everybody's like, wow, Ooh. this this is for real. This is a real yeah. deal. This yeah. is the real deal here. It was a real deal. And at the end of the day, I just remember getting in the ring. I was nervous, right? Because yeah. I know he was too. And I'm like, <laughs> we walk out on like huge crowd. I'm like, there's no turning back now. Like, <laughs> you go in the ring, and, and um, and we go out, and we start, you know, Bob and weaving. And I remember we hit each other, boom, boom. And like, I remember he, he hit me, and, the, and before that, I thought we were fighting with 16 ounce gloves, which are pretty big gloves. They're pretty padded. And then they came in before the fight, and he threw in some cheap, like, homemade 12 ounce gloves. And I'm like, dude, this would be like a fist fight because they were thin. Like, and they were like cheapy foam. And I'm like, dude, this is going to get gnarly. So I had him tape my hands, like, super, super tight. And we went in. I remember the first few punches, and I got hit. And I was like, freak, man. This is gnarly. Like, it, it was like a real punch, you know? And I flashed my eyes, and I'm like, and that's when I'm like, all right, you got to dig deep because this is going to be a real fight for a while. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And overall, I think it was like, if you could say probably one of the best fights, now I watch it later. It was a good fight, you know. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, I couldn't say, it. was there a winner? I don't even think there was. I think in the end we just beat each other up pretty good. And, and I think it was, it was just a cool experience. I'm glad I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I gained a lot more respect for him 
after that fight, you know, I was like, you know, I think it's kind of like, that's just like growing up and, you know, as a kid in the schoolyard, you know, you have your beef with everyone. And when you eventually fight with that dude and you, and then after you usually high five, become friends. Right. Yeah. And, and then you have more respect for that guy. I don't know why it is, but that's just how men work. And, and um, that's just kind of how that went down. Richard Chase Light incorporates five modes, including stroke, break, running, courtesy, and reverse in a compact 7-inch by 2-inch fixture. The Richard Chase attaches to any roll bar or flat mounting surface, and users can control each of the multiple functions independently. The Richard Chase is one more way for off-road enthusiasts to own but, and then you guys started racing against each other in rallycross, right? How did yeah. the whole, I know the off-road truck, how that kind of thing evolved, yeah. but how did rallycross open up? Because you spent some time there, and I still say, like, you know, you talk back at, at GRC and things like that, you had the gnarliest pass of all time in rallycross. It was in Vegas. Like, you went from the last row and passed everybody to second <laughs> on, like, the start or yeah, something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, how did that door open up? Because you had some really, you had a good run yeah. in rallycross. Yeah, and I think rally was uh, probably one of the, the most fun things I got to do because it was so technical. Uh, uh, but I got into it because when you are an X Games athlete and you ha love X Games and, and then you've been hurt so many times, you're like, man, I can't keep doing freestyle motocross. I can't keep doing best trick. What can I do to still be a part of this family? And then when X Games brought rally in, I'm like, perfect. This is going to be a perfect trans transfer. But the problem is it's very expensive. And, and um, I was lucky enough to uh, get in with Ford. And, and Ford was coming into X Games at the time. And I had some momentum with my name and what I did in X Games. So they, they brought me into the team with Olsbergs and, and um, you know, some of the uh, faster guys. And I was able to be on a good rally team for a long time and learn so much. What I learned in rallycross racing carried over into all forms of racing, so much data, analytics, and, and, and so much stuff of, like, so much of, of learning how a car works. And and that, that was about racing for, for tenths on the track. And, man, I love rally. I thought it was intense. You know, that, that was – I miss it. I wish America could figure out how to do a good rally race right. and, and get it done right because – it is so fun, but I don't know, America. I don't know why they just haven't clinged to it. Yeah, know? it's still there, yeah. and it's like it's fledgling along. Yeah. And I don't know if they've quite figured it out yet, but yeah, I, know. I know. Like, it's funny because I put I got this Facebook group that follows a radio show, and it was funny because I put out I was like, anybody got any questions for Brian Deegan? Literally, the top question ones was, are we ever going to see him in a rally car again? Yeah, <laughs> I would. I mean, like, trust me, I've had conversations with uh, Toyota about it because they're talking about doing a rally car, bringing a rally car out. Um, I said, if you do, I'll be your driver, you know? And, and so, uh, and then, you know, there's obviously, uh, you know, all the manufacturers out there that have talked about it, but at the end of the day, there's just no home for it right now. And I know there's a little series, try they're trying to keep things going, but if you go to Europe, like I did, I went and raced in Finland, and, and you show up and you're like, dude, this is crazy. Like 60 dudes trying to make the final of six, and they're all pretty fast, you know, and so you go over there. It's 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 like how I wouldn't say Supercross, but it's how probably American Motocross is. You know, you got twenty thousand fans out there screaming, freaking out. Courses that have been there for decades. Um, it's just established in Europe. It's like you know? Cranon, right? It's like Cranon. Yeah, yeah. It's established. It's not going anywhere. Um, but I, I, if anything, I probably miss the most to this day is rally. Yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you like the you like the stage stuff better out in the hills, or you like the you know, coming in and out of the stadium type of stuff, like the X Games stuff. Dude, uh, I I way too scared of the stage rally. Yeah, because <laughs> I rally. did it. Like, <laughs> here's X Games. They said, well, you don't race rally, so if we're going to qualify you for X Games rally, um, you have to go race a rally race. And so they put me in a stage rally race somewhere, I think, some woods rally up in Pennsylvania or something. And I got in this Subaru I had to rent. And and, uh, and I had this co-pilot. I forget her name, but it was a female, and she was in X Games quite a few times. But Chrissy Beavis, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so she was my co-pilot or <laughs> spotter or whatever you call it. And she, so we're, we we do the um, 
pre-rec or whatever and write our notes and then we go on the race and i'm like flying through the woods like at 100 or whatever through these huge trees on each side of the course and i'm flying i'm like dude this is gnarly like if i go off course you're pretty much almost dead like you're in a tree at 100 (laughs) i'm like is this supposed to be like this gnarly and and i just didn't feel comfortable you know because i've always raced on closed course or bigger you know tracks or the set so I come flying through these hills, and they're blind with trees lying in the road. I'm in the forest. And she calls, uh, you know, let's say it's a, it was, a, she calls like a, a R5, which would be a right five, which is almost like fifth gear kind of. But, um, but it really was, a, was like a right one. It was like a first gear tight 180. And I come over this blind crest, like going probably 80, and there's a cliff you know, tight right-hander. I'm like, dude, what? I ain't stopping. So I just flick the car going backwards into this cliff and flip and start flipping, you know, and she's in the car with boom, boom, boom. And we get st- rolled down this cliff and get stuck. And, and we're stuck on this blind turn. I'm like, dude, we're going to get hammered. And I was so scared. She gets in the car. She's all gnarly, opens the car, starts pulling these orange cones and laying them up the track because guys are coming. And I'm running. I'm like, I'm out of here. And I jump down the cliff and, like, fly down this cliff. And then, uh, so anyway, that was my intro to stage rally. Yeah. And, and when I watch stage rally, you guys drive, I would say, in, in the world, they're the best drivers in the world. I don't think there's a better driver than a stage rally driver. They just are so good with car control. You know, I, I could try to name one. I don't know. Like, I think, you know, F1, yeah, it's, you know, they're great. F1 doesn't dodge trees. You know what I'm saying? Right. They ain't dodging trees yeah. at 100 some miles per hour. But their car control, when I saw Petter Solberg for the first time in Finland, I just stood there and watched at the side of the track. I'm like, who is that? And the way he drove a car was like one with a car. And I'm like, I've never seen someone drive a car like that. You know, it was one of the, probably one of the coolest things I experienced going to Europe and I, watching that dude drive a car. It was, dude, that guy's sick, like, big time. No, he's gnarly. His kid, Oliver, he's like 16 and shredding it right yeah. now on stage rally. Just clipped David Higgins and Pastrana recently. And yeah. yeah. Kid's yeah. an animal at like Is 16. He? Yeah. yeah. Like, he's so young, he can't even race here in the States. Like, they, he doesn't have a driver's license, so the right. co-driver has to drive, and then he races the stages and gets out. But the yeah. kid's like, he's like prodigy type stuff but yeah yeah you know that being said you're still racing i know we yeah. got uh glenn helen this weekend man and uh you know it's like one of those like i know you're still mm-hmm. going haley shows yeah. up here and there like i josh and i were talking you guys don't prep the trucks here right you guys yeah. uh no. no so the trucks here just kind of back up play trucks or what yeah we we uh had everything here for many years you know when we're winning championships and in this that it all happened out of here you know and so but when you get to a point where you have you know six to eight to ten employees at your house every day you know, the wife gets over it, right? <laughs> Let's just be honest. Like, it, it just gets, it, it invades your personal space a little too much after time. And, and um, so I ended up moving the whole race operation to San Luis Obispo with Paul Michelle out of Racer Services. And uh, it's way better. It's a drive and drive style. I show up, I race. Um, it's, you know, we go to test, I just show up. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, it took a lot of probably the inside of me being around the race truck all the time out of my life which probably was an advantage for me. But um, I still, I just love racing off-road because it's kind of like racing dirt bikes, but you're in a roll cage, and it's safer. And, and uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, it's still a thrill to me. You know, I love racing. Well, you're still winning too, right? I mean, yeah, you, you yeah, once in a year. while. <laughs> once in a while. I won the first race, which kind of like was like, wow, okay, I guess this is going to be a good year. And then we went out, and I think, you know, Lucas with, with a lot of people – don't understand you know there's trying to be a motor change thing going on now with the 410 motors coming in they're trying to make it more affordable and have this like uh, crate motor that's a uh, 410 steel block we run aluminum block you know 436s they're like 65 70,000 a motor and we run two of them and we swap them out through the season when they blow up it's like 40 g's you know so uh they want to go to these crate 410s which are about half the price, where you can run all season. It's to make the class more affordable, hopefully bring in more talent, more drivers. I agree with the move. The problem is you, they want to have a transition year or two or three years um, to basically where you can run the old motor or the new motor. The new motors, they get a start out front. So, you know, they get this big, huge start, <laughs> like lead start, which I personally am not a huge fan of it. I know I'm supposed to support it because I like the series and I want it to work, but, like, being in the being in the race sucks. Like, you know, because you're like, dude, the guy's so far gone and you have to be have perfect 
laps with dudes pounding on you while they're just getting clean laps. And by the time you catch them, it's usually too late, you know? And um, so, anyway, it's kind of funky. I just hopefully by next year everyone throws 410s in their trucks and we have a healthy Pro 2 class and we all can go racing, you know? Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, in talking about that, I know last year and then this year, you and Haley both made the trip back to Cranon, yep. dude. How was that? Because that's like another level of craziness back there. Oh, yeah. It was the 50th, so I felt like we had to be there. I felt like if you raced off-road, that was like a race you had to be at. And I think everyone that had anything with a knobby tire on it went to that race this year. Yeah, even the graph pulled his out. He yeah. didn't run all year, right? Yeah, and I didn't expect him. He threw a 410 in it and went, and he kicked ass. And I'm like, dude, we should have 410s in our trucks now because they have the advantage, right? They get a start out front. He, he did good. He drove good. And it was, I mean, that overall, the whole vibe of the whole week on the weekend was just cool, you know? I think from the parade... You know, my favorite part of the parade was the dude who was probably 90 years old in the old wooden truck shooting the shotgun in the crowd. I'm like, yes, you don't see that in California. Right. No old dude with a shotgun blowing it off around crowds of people in California. But um, uh, You'd have Homeland Security there. Oh, dude, dude. be locked up. <laughs> that dude would have been tased in like two seconds, dude. But, yeah, no, I had a blast. Cranon was awesome. It was cool for me to get to share it with my daughter. You know, obviously she's going to get super busy with NASCAR. Um, but my goal is to always be able to pull her away from stock car racing and race off-road when she has time. Because I think that's her key to success is her dirt skills. And every time she goes and race off-road, she comes back to stock car as a better driver. She's more aggressive. You know, the guys in stock car, she doors them and dings them. And they get so upset. And I'm like, that's every lap in off-road. That's every turn. You know, if, you, if you're within striking distance in off-road – the last turn, what do you think is going to happen? You're like, gonna, yeah. Yeah. Take the shot, right? Yeah. That's what you do, you know? So in stock cars, they're like, do not hit me. And I'm like, the two different worlds, man. But anyway, I think it's uh, good for Haley. And she's, you know, she's an off-roader at the end of the day. She likes the dirt. She likes to be in the dirt. So what's next for the Deegans? Obviously, you know, we got Haley, uh, you know, as we kind of wrap them here, we got Haley shredding it in stock cars. You got the boys both coming up doing their thing. Uh, you know, you, you're you still racing off-road. Yeah. I know you said if the right opportunity popped up, you might like to try a trophy truck mm-hmm. at some point. Like, what, what's next for the Deegan family, man? Yeah, no, I you know, I talked to Haley before she gets busy. It would be cool to go race Baja with Haley, you know, me and her in a truck, and go do maybe the 500 or, or something that would be a cool story and get to experience that with a good team. And, uh, and uh, you know, we talked to Herbs a little bit about it. You know, maybe Monster could get involved and help with that. But um, I think it would be a cool story with me and Haley racing. Uh, but our focus for me, I'm going to be in short course. You know, I have a good deal with Mickey Thompson Tire. And, uh, you know, with my Deegan 38 tires, it's been a good business for me. So off-road is kind of the base of that. So I'm going to stay in off-road and race for, you know, I don't know how much longer, but keep racing. And then um, Haley is going to do her uh, go to ARCA next year, some k and racing, and probably touch the truck series. So uh, that's a big step. And then Hayden's doing motocross, supercross, along with Hudson. Hudson's doing football, just kind of doing normal sports stuff. And uh, But Hayden is on his way to, you know, Supercross, you know, who knows how far it's going to go, but he's really, really good on a dirt bike. So um, I have to make enough time for him. That's that's what's been hard with the whole racing world with Haley's transition. And my, my toughest thing I have to do is make time for everyone in the family, you know, because, you, know, um, you know, a wife and marriage takes time. You know, you got to make time for that. And then you have my daughter, whose NASCAR thing is going to be 30-some races next year, you know. And, and uh, so you got to make time for that. And then Hayden's motocross, he's got four to five nationals we have to go to uh, a year. And then Hudson's waiting on the fence, you know, as a third child. And, you know, and it's important he has to get included too. And, and then uh, so – Man, and then I have to race trucks on top of it, you know, and can we still win, right? Because if I ain't winning, there's no reason for me to be there because ain't no one going to want to pay for it. So uh, that's how racing works, unfortunately. But so uh, that's kind of my, my thing. And like I said, we're kind of relaunching Militia. Um, you know, in, in the business world, I have, you know, uh, like all my Jeep products and, and um, I'm coming out with F-150 products and, and um coming out with uh, pretty much all the manufactured Toyota products. When I say products, bumpers, sidesteps, uh, you know, things, you accessories you'd put on your car. And they're sold through Extreme Terrain uh, online. It's a Deegan 38 product. And uh, so that that's the my off-road thing that I'm t- touching and still, you know, want to stay involved with off-road through that. And, uh, you know, a lot of different things that I do. So 
It's all good. <laughs> now a podcast, YouTube yeah, channel, yeah, you're right. rolling, right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> let's just let's be honest, right? Social media is where it's at right now. I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and it's a big business, right? So you know now, you know people have waited long enough. Like when you post on Instagram every day, yeah, it's cool, ha. Huh? We're we're all fighting for numbers, and we all have our our goals we want to reach. But really, that's that's for free, kind of, right? So, so then you kind of get to the point where you're, enough complaining happened. YouTube says, okay, well, we're going to pay you for content. Oh, and then Facebook started paying for content. And then now, you know, Instagram's coming. They're going to have to soon. So in the end, it's a great business, right? If you focus on it, you know, I know because I was, you know, yell, yell at my kids sometimes about like, you know, get off the phone or, you know, this, that. But dude, that's how you make a living now. So you're that dad. Get off the phone, yeah. bitch, and you come to dinner. Oh, I no am. No phones when, at dinner. Yeah, yeah. Well, when my daughter's crashing cars, you know, yes. <laughs> I'm like, dude, off the phone. But no, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a big business right now. We're heavily invested in social media. And it's fun, you know, like, like if I could, my main goal was if I could figure out how to do what I love and make a living at it, that's, that was goal number one, accomplish that with the sports I did. And then now it's like, how do I stay around my family as much as possible and make a living, you know? And, and uh, so now that's social media. So I, I mean, we have so much content. I can't, I can't film it all. I can't put it all out, you know, between all the kids every day. So, um, you know, thankful for that, you know, thankful for the, for all the networks. And I think the podcast is going to be the, the big one. I think that's the one we're going to get depth in depth into stories and get to talk to people and, and open up a lot of cool relationships. Well, that's, sure. that's something yeah. that you touched on earlier that I think is really cool is there's the, the encyclopedia of stories that you have from <laughs> year after year after year and how deep you can go and, and, yeah. and the lessons you learn from it. Cause at the end of the day, yeah, we're, we're here to entertain people, but if you can, if you can touch one kid and and spark a uh, you know a family discussion or help a uh, a young woman make a, a jump into the pros and, and radically affect her life, that's awesome. Right? Oh yeah, You're giving back then for sure. You know, I agree. I mean, Haley, like you're saying, I've seen so many little girls now at the racetrack. You know, just for example, you know, you look at the mod cart class or the karting class, I mean, there's so many little girls in there now. And hopefully, Haley had a part of that. You know, it's kind of cool. You know, it's to rad. look back, it's pretty rad. I I, I see a surgence of young female racers coming and and i think it's cool i think it can happen hopefully haley leads the way and becomes the first nascar champion the first nascar winner in the major series uh it's going to be hard it won't be easy we know it's going to take a ton of work and i just i am excited for that day yeah well i'm excited to watch the uh watch the career arc man and uh fun catching up brian i know we'll see you out there glenn helen but uh, i appreciate the time and uh you know looking forward to uh episode number one of yours with uh with (laughs) tp man that's going to be exciting yeah thanks thanks for having me for sure 